Good morning. He is risen. risen Welcome to St. John St. James for our festival service here for Easter. Um, Let's begin our time with our our invocation. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Why do you look for the living among the dead? We join in our opening hymn. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Jesus Christ was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God. He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead 
and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in him will live even though they die. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This is the day the Lord has made. Christ is risen. We join in song. The Lord be with you. We pray. Almighty God, by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you conquered death and opened the gate to eternal life. Grant that we, who have been raised with him through baptism, may walk in newness of life and ever rejoice in the hope of sharing his glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our time in the Word begins in the Old Testament. We look to Job chapter 19, verses 23 through 27. A beautiful confession of Job's uh, faith in the resurrection. It's an expression of our joy and our faith and confidence in the resurrection this day as well. Oh, that my words were recorded that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end He will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see Him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. The word of the Lord. We join in our hymn response.
Our epistle lesson for today, we see that the Lord has given the same faith that Job had to the Apostle Paul and inspires him to write these words again, a beautiful confession of our belief in the resurrection. From 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we begin with verse 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The word of the Lord. We continue with our hymn response. Let's stand out of reverence for our Lord as we hear a gospel lesson for today. We give our attention to Mark chapter 16, the first eight verses. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated as in we invite the praise choir to come forward and sing their anthem. Judy, Judy, Judy. She was just so excited to play for us. Thank you, Judy.
As we wait for our organist to get up to the organ bench, I kept thinking to myself as we started, really, you got to let Dan stand right next to Zach? <laughs> thank you for your... <laughs> Thank you for your beautiful song. It looks like we're ready. Let's join in singing Christ Jesus Lay in Death Strong Bands. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, and our risen Savior, Jesus. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, they were sure they knew what they were going to find on that Sunday morning. Many of them were there on Mount Calvary, and they saw him on that cross, and many of them had seen him bow his head and give up his spirit. 
At least a few of them stuck around and watched as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took that lifeless body down from the cross, and at least two of them were there at the tomb as they saw that body be quickly prepared and then put into the tomb, and they watched as that stone was rolled away in front of the entrance. So that Sunday morning when they got up exceedingly early, I'm sure they were very sure of what they were going to find. And as Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome make that trek to the tomb, the sun begins to peek over the horizon, and the ladies begin to realize they found themselves in a little bit of a predicament. Who is going to roll away the stone from the tomb? A legitimate question. Now, these ladies, they know their own limitations. They know that they're going to need some help. It's a very large stone, so... How are we going to get in? But why are they asking the question? Why are they going to the tomb at such an early hour in the morning? Why are they concerned about rolling a stone away? Why did they buy the spices in the first place? Yeah, they were sure they knew what they were going to find when they came to that tomb. So there were probably more questions on their mind than just the logistics of how to roll a stone from an entrance. It's not hard to imagine that because, well, you and I have our own questions when it comes to death of people that we love and care about. Yes, you have your questions too if you have the funeral planning that is your responsibility. You're not just, you're not thinking about rolling a stone from an entrance. But there's questions about the casket and the headstone and the verses that you're going to be reading and the songs that you're going to be singing and the number of people who are going to show up. There's a lot that goes into funeral planning. Of course, there are the other questions. Questions like, what's next? Questions like, well, they say that I'm going to get through this and it's going to be okay. But how? Questions like, well, yes, I know indeed that he's no longer suffering. And yes, she's no longer suffering. But what about me? What next? What are we going to do? We have these questions because you and I both know it. Death is final. You see that grave? You see that casket? You see this headstone? That's it. There's nothing more to be done. Then there's that other question. What about my death? What about my end? Since the moment that you have been conceived, you have been taking every moment of your life has been taking you closer to death. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. And even if you don't have uh, these conscious thoughts about death, you still have this innate feeling and knowledge that your time is coming to an end. As your body wears out, you're not able to do the things that you once were able to do. Your memory, your mind begins to fade. You recognize and you feel that your days are going more quickly and faster than they did before. You recognize, yeah, your time is short. Hence why we try to fit so much time in this, so much stuff into this life. The accomplishments need to be done by this age, and these successes need to be done by this time, and I need to have this much saved over here. I need to get all this stuff fit into this time because you recognize the time is short. It's coming to an end. Even for young adults and students, you feel this. You have that feeling. You have that anxiety, the burden of needing to make sure that you do what is right right now, make the right decisions when it comes to your education, your career, your relationship with friends, with love, with all these different things. You have this anxiety and you have this burden. You need to make it right and do what is right because you recognize the time is short. It's eventually going to come to an end. Which that makes it all the more difficult because you remember all those times when you have not done what is right, when you have made the wrong decisions 
when you did what was easier rather than what was God-pleasing. So as we go with the women to the tomb on this Easter morning, what are you bringing with you? Probably not carrying spices in your pocket at the moment. But you have your burden of your own sins that you have done and that you've committed the wrong choices that you have made. You maybe want to be rejoicing, but inside you're mourning. You're struggling, you're wrestling with something on your heart, something on your mind. Maybe it's questions of your own death. You have been thinking about it for some reason. What's going to happen to those that I love? What's going to happen for them? Are they going to be taken care of? Are they going to be okay? Am I ready, ready to go? Do I know where I'm going to end up one day? Perhaps it's other questions that you have on your mind. Perhaps, like the women, you come to the tomb with your own preconceived notions. You have your own ideas of how God should be living, ruling, and acting in your life. You have your own preconceived notions of what other people are, should be doing for you and in your life. Perhaps you come to the tomb this morning, and in reality, you're doing just fine. And at the same time, you're also trembling a little bit because there are things in the future that you just don't know what's going to happen. Maybe you are excited, but you're nervous. You just are. You're not sure. Perhaps you go to the tomb this morning begrudgingly. And if you're really honest, you're here only because other people expected you to be here. And that's why you're here. Whatever it is that you bring to the tomb this morning, whatever it is that you're carrying, whatever questions that are on your mind, whatever fears there are, it's good to have you here. And with the women, as we go to that tomb, no, the, the gospel writers, they don't tell us what is all on their mind. But from what they're doing, we have a really good idea of what they think they're going to find. That's why they bought the spices. That's why they're asking questions about rolling a stone away. They saw their Lord die. They know what that means when someone dies. There's nothing more that they can do. Even this anointing, this final act of love for their Savior's body, it's for a lifeless corpse. Or as one pastor put it, it's a bag of bones. And then they look up. And someone and something has taken that stone and hurled it away from the entrance. And curiosity, it leads them to then look into this dark hole of death. And what do they see? A young man sitting there with long flowing white robes. Does he have a smile on his face? Is he smirking a little bit? Can you see his excitement out of the multitude of angels? He gets to be the one who shares this good news. Of course the women are going to be alarmed. That's how sinful human beings react when they see perfect heavenly beings like angels. Of course those women are going to be alarmed. They expected to find a dead body. Plain and simple. That is what they were sure they were going to find. Death is the end. It's final. That's what it's supposed to be there. But the angel says, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Yes, ladies, you are right. You saw what you did. Yes, ladies, Jesus was crucified. Yes, Jesus died. But Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, just as he told you. Yes, if Jesus' body was still laying in that tomb, then yes, those women have every right and should be extremely alarmed. As Paul wrote it in our second lesson, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Christ's body is still laying there in that tomb, 
then you're still in your sins. And for all of the bravado that we have, all that confidence, all that strength that we want to convince other people that we have, our weak human hearts cannot help but tremble when we think about our sins. You have done serious damage to people because of what you have thought, said, and done. I have done serious damage to people because of my sin. And the fact is that you can only bury those skeletons in the closet so deep. And you can only lie to yourself for so long. But Christ is risen. He is not here. Just as he said. That means you can stop burying the, the sins in the closet, the skeletons in the closet. That means you can stop lying to yourself. Your sin has already been taken care of. It's not, no longer held against you. Your sin died with Jesus on the cross, and it was buried with him in the tomb, and that's where it remained. But Jesus is not there. Christ is risen. Yes, indeed, Jesus was crucified on the cross. He had to be. He wasn't forced to do it by any means. No, he wanted to go to the cross. No, he couldn't come down that cross to prove that he was a son of God. He couldn't because he loves you. No, he couldn't stop the torment that he was enduring on that cross, the suffering that he faced. He couldn't because he came to save you. And so God forsakes God, and the Father turns his back on his own son because Jesus became sin for us. And he dies because that is the result of sin. But Christ is risen. He is not here. He lives. And because Jesus lives, that means that your sin is no longer yours. It means that death itself has died. Yes, in Adam, we all die. We all have our end dates in this world unless Jesus returns first. But in Christ, we have been made alive. And so we say right along with Job, as we sang earlier, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. Yet in my flesh, I will see God. Jesus' resurrection proves that Job was right. And it's proof for you and me too. Because Jesus lives, because Jesus was raised from the dead, I know that one day I will too. I know that I will see my Redeemer, I will see my Savior Jesus with my own two eyeballs and in my own flesh, I will see God. And I will be with the Lord forever in perfect peace, happiness, and joy where the last enemy death has already been defeated and it will haunt us no more. Because Christ is risen, just as he said. And that life that Jesus has promises to us in the end, well, that's life that he already gives you today. We don't have to wait for all of the gifts till then. You already have that right now. You have a peace that surpasses understanding. Because the Father gave you Jesus, he's going to give you every good thing. Because Jesus died and rose for you, we know that he's working all these things, everything, even the bad and the terrible, Along with the good, all of it, he's working together for your good to bring you ultimately to him. Because Jesus lives, we know that our God is always faithful and will keep all of his promises. Your sins really are forgiven. You really do have peace with God. He has given you new life already today. For many of you, it started right there in the baptismal font. Death cannot harm you because you already died once there in the waters of baptism. You died with Jesus and you were raised a new creation. And he gave you, gave you a new life with him. Where sin no longer controls you, sin does not define you, even Satan himself has no power over you. And the sting of death has been removed because Jesus lives. This is the good news that you and I have and that we believe through faith. And this is the good news that the women and we are sent to share. Notice how the angel says it. It says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. If there were a group of guys who really felt like they screwed up, it probably were the 12. And Peter. Peter who denied knowing his Lord three different times. The shame, the guilt that had to be weighing on his mind, eating him up from the inside. Go tell him the good news. 
Jesus doesn't hold grudges. He died to let grudges go. And he lives. This good news is for you, Peter. Your sins are forgiven. I want you to be with me. Go tell the good news to the disciples and Peter. And that person who has heard your invitations before and rejected them, they need the good news again. And to that person who has wronged you in some shape or form, they need the good news too. And that family member and that friend, and you who is struggling with sin and temptation, and you who is uncertain about the future and has all those worries and concerns that are in your life, and you who is doing completely fine, but, you know, and you, especially you, Jesus lives for you. The questions aren't going away. Most fears will still be around. Yes, on this side of eternity, death still haunts us and the temptations that continue to pester and annoy. But Christ is risen. He is not here. He is where he promises to be. That is his word, where he preaches and speaks into your ears and onto your heart to remind you of his good promises that he's going to do just as he said. He's there where he tells you he's going to be there in the bread and wine. He gives you his real body and blood, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins and the strengthening of your faith. We know he is because he does just as he says. And he's there at the baptismal font where every day we return to stop hiding sins in closets and lying to ourselves, but to confess our sins and to be raised to the new life that he has given to you because Christ is risen just as he told you. Amen. A peace of God that surpasses all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith until life everlasting. We join together in singing the next stanzas of our hymn.
I'll invite you to stand as we continue with the confession of faith we use the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with our responsive prayer of the church. Almighty and merciful God, on this glorious day we rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Increase our faith that the message of the empty tomb may fill our lives and make us glad each day. Remove the hurt of death from all who mourn. In moments of grief, call believers through the voice of our good shepherd and embolden us to follow his promises. In their hopelessness of despair, turn the faithless to trust in the only way, truth, and life. King of kings and Lord of lords, destroy all dominion, authority, and power that stands against you, whether seen or unseen. Whatever evil exerts itself against your saving will, false teaching or lukewarm faith, Satan's lies or worldly pleasures, empty worship or futile religion, rule it for the sake of the gospel's free course. Walk among our churches, O living one, as the faithful witness and firstborn from the dead, as your angel sent women with news of the risen Christ, call women in our church to announce he is risen. As you sent your disciples with the breath of the Spirit, call those in our church full of the Spirit and wisdom to administer the keys of the kingdom. Heavenly Father, keep the baptized united with your Son and his resurrection. Put to death the fleshly urges of those caught in addictions. Clothe in your righteousness anyone ashamed of good intentions which have fallen short. And assure those searching for purpose that their eternal identity as your dear child is sealed. Thank you. We remember especially, Lord, uh, our brother Gene Rosera, 
Um, he's been searching for answers, and uh, in your good time, Lord, you revealed some of those answers. And so as he undergoes colon surgery in the near future, Lord, we'd ask that you'd bless the surgeons and caregivers and uh, the treatments that will follow. We'd ask that you use this for your good purposes. Draw close to Gene and his family and friends, those concerned about him, and reassure him of your love. If you have the power, Lord, over the grave, you most certainly have the power over the things that we deal with in our health issues. And so reassure him and those who care for him. Keep them strong in their faith and remind them that you use all things for your good purposes. And now, Lord, we ask that you hear us as we pray in silence. O Lord of life, you have done mighty things for us. We pray through him who is the beginning and the end, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our worship continues with the celebration of the sacrament. We give thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world, and by his glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. As we remember Jesus' death and rising from the grave, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ, forever. Through him, we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, and with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, he gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. We join in song.
Congregation may be seated. Those of you who are in fellowship with us are invited to receive the Lord's Supper at the direction of our ushers. Note that we'll have two distribution hymns this morning, as needed, hymn 675 and 445. Those can be found in the blue hymnals.
Would you please stand? And for those communing in the pew, take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. It's the true blood of our Lord poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We continue in prayer. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. We'll close with our final hymn, In Christ Alone.
Please be seated for a few announcements. Uh, a reminder for you that we have calls out to Mr. Chris and Mrs. Jean Avery uh, as teachers here at St. John St. James. Please keep them in your prayers as they deliberate. Uh, also, just a reminder, just it's a couple weeks now. It's coming up on April 14th. The LYA live auction uh, will be taking place. The pancake feed will be after the second service, not in between, uh, just after. With that, we wish you God's richest blessings. Thanks for joining us today. We pray that the Lord would continue to bless your day and your Easter. Uh, for those who'd like, they're still serving breakfast, or they will be after um, after this service in the commons. So, uh, I think there's plenty of food. Come and join them and enjoy the the fruits of their labor. With that, we wish you God's richest blessings until we see you again.